Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at www.veritas.org. The following material is copyrighted and may not be duplicated, reproduced, or redistributed without prior written consent from the Veritas Forum. Join us as we explore true life. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. And uh, my plan is to talk for a while and then we'll have a, a discussion. And uh, so if you have questions as I go along, please don't forget them and uh, we'll come to them. Uh, the topic this afternoon is a rather large topic and one that uh, unfortunately has been perhaps overdone in the past, but it's recently been brought to life again by a leading figure in uh, contemporary intellectual life in America named Stephen Jay Gould, who has published a book called Rocks of Ages, put the plural, Rocks of Ages. And um, Stephen Gould is concerned about the conflict between uh, religion and science because there has uh, currently been a considerable stirring that has called in question uh, especially the theory of evolution, which uh, Gould is very uh, involved with in his professional work. And uh, as he says in the preamble to his book, uh, he, his intention is to give a blessedly simple and entirely conventional resolution to the issue of the uh, supposed conflict between science and religion. And so just to sharpen the focus, uh, I have, uh, as you may know from the title of the talk in your publications, taken as the topic of discussion, why religion and science must conflict. Why religion and science must conflict. And so I will be examining some of the things that he says, but hope to bring to light uh, the more general issues about the, t the relationship between the teachings of religion and the teachings of science. Let me say that I am not here to bash science or necessarily to exalt religion, but to try to focus an issue that is of considerable importance uh, to all of us. I believe that science is a part of God's work in human history. And uh, when you know something about the history of science, one of the things that strikes you is uh, how uh, the advances often come with people who look like they are half asleep at least. Arthur Kessler actually wrote a book called Sleepwalkers, which was about the uh, people who originated modern science. Well, sleepwalking isn't so bad, and uh, sometimes, you know, we have to function under the direction of tendencies of thought and feeling that are not fully conscious. And I think that that is one of the areas where God works in human history and uh, enables us to learn things and make progress the story of human history, I believe, is the story of the advance of freedom. I don't hesitate at all to use that language of Hegel. And as I said last night, freedom depends upon the advance of knowledge and truth. And uh, so the uh, connection here should be pretty obvious. Uh, we, for example, couldn't be gathered here today doing the things we're doing today, uh, but for the advances of science. And in a little while, I'll go get on an airplane. Maybe some of you will, too. And I'm very thankful for science in that regard, because if you had to walk it or drive it, or drive it even, um, you would be very happy for airplanes, as I am. And uh, so that gives freedom. So science is the story of the advance of our knowledge uh, and the advance of our freedom, our abilities. And, uh, of course, one of the great challenges that has been noted since well, into the, uh, since, well since the last of the 1800s was the need of moral development to keep up with uh, the advancement of knowledge because the more you know, the better you need to be. And the more you know, the more dangerous you are. And we've had some recent lessons in our history on that point. So let me go to the question, why religion and science must conflict? And let me begin by just giving you the simple statement. I think that sometimes is helpful, and then we can worry it to death as the hour proceeds. 
but the short answer is that science and religion deal with the same thing, human life. Now, of course, there are areas where they're dealing with different things, but they both are concerned with human life. But they try to explain it or to understand it in terms of different types of considerations. One, physical or natural, if you like, and the other, non-physical or, for want of a better word, spiritual. And uh, that is, in very short terms why religion and science must conflict, is they're trying to come to an understanding of the same thing, human life, from two different points of view. And the problem that Gould has is to divide them in such a way that they never interfere. And that is going to be his solution to the problem. And my comments on his solution will be to the effect you can't do that, and I'll try to explain why. But just to illustrate, for example, scientific research into human life and experience will want to account for everything in it in terms of the entities and events dealt with by the so-called natural sciences. Roughly physics, chemistry, biology, physiology, and things such as that. Now, the philosophical formulation of this approach is today called naturalism. And uh, I certainly don't want to uh, get in a quarrel about the, the words. The words are perfectly all right. Naturalism is not a bad thing. Uh, it is, I would like to say, uh, almost an inevitable, an inevitable thing so far as our need to understand the natural world. So if we want to understand disease and health and we understand how the planets move and the weather and all those kinds of things, then we would look for natural causes. And one of the scandals of the past is the attempt to substitute something other for natural causes where only natural causes were concerned. And these are often referred to as God of the gaps arguments, where you don't understand what's going on, you put God in. And, of course, that has a deservedly bad reputation. And uh, now I want to just read a comment or two from Gould about the relationship between science and religion. Here's what he says on page four of his book, Rocks of Ages. Science tries to account for the factual character of the natural world and to develop theories that coordinate and explain these facts. So it tries to document the factual character of the natural world and to develop theories that coordinate and explain these facts. I have no problem with that. That's, I think, a correct understanding of what science attempts to do. Religion, on the other hand, operates in the equally important but utterly different realm of human purposes, meanings, and values, subjects that the factual domain of science might illuminate but can never resolve. And uh, Gould wants to divide these two areas, and remember one is the factual character of the natural world and theories that help explain those facts, and the other is the area of human purposes, meanings, and values. And, he wants to divide these into what he calls magisteria, or domains of teaching. And uh, he says what we're adopting is, he's in the book, is a, the central principle of respectful non-interference. So you have uh, people involved with facts and then people who are involved with meaning, morality, uh, values, and religion. Uh, he, le he lumps all these together. And uh, so you have uh, two areas of teaching. And they are dealing with totally different things. Now that's what I hope to get you to think carefully about uh, as to whether or not that is actually possible. Here he says on page 6, these two magisteria do not overlap. 
nor do they encompass all inquiry. Consider, for example, the magisterium of art and the meaning of beauty. And here's the phrase for his book. To cite the old cliches, science gets the age of rocks, and religion the rock of ages. Science studies how the heavens go, and religion how to go to heaven. I think that conveys the idea, the basic idea, uh, but um, you may be led soon to question whether or not this is a respectful non-interference when you begin to realize what he's actually saying. And uh, for example, on pages uh, 21 uh, and 22, he says this, Nature works by invariant laws subject to scientific explanation. The natural world cannot contradict scripture, for God, as author of both, cannot speak against himself. So, if some contradiction seems to emerge between a well-valid scientific result and a conventional reading of scripture, then we had better reconsider our exegesis. For the natural world does not lie, but words can convey many meanings, some allegorical or metaphorical. And then he goes on to enlarge upon this point about taking the metaphorical or allegorical meaning of Scripture. Uh, continuing on page 22, he says, Recognizing the primacy of science in its proper magisterium, we agree not to assert a scriptural interpretation contrary to scientific discovery, but to re-examine Scripture instead. For science rules the magisterium of factual truth about nature. Okay, well, in one sense, I don't think there's anything really problematic about that. Um, but you'll notice that what happens when there is an issue of conflict, you rewrite your scripture. You change the meaning of it. And you might begin to get uneasy at that point about how much of a respectful non-interference we are enjoying. Uh, and you would be right to be uneasy about that. Uh, another thing that comes up here is that uh, religion actually turns out not to be even needed on this division of the pie. Uh, he says on uh, page uh, 60, as a first implication for potential suspicion, he's addressing the fact that you may be getting suspicious at this point. Uh, he says, as a first implication, I have stated that while every person must formulate a moral theory under the magisterium of ethics and meaning, and while religion anchors this magisterium in most cultural traditions, and here's the operative terms, the chosen pathway of ethics and meaning need not invoke religion at all but may ground moral discourse in other disciplines. Philosophy, for example, as he says. Well, actually, we've had a lot of experience with that by now, and we know that that doesn't actually work very well. But his point is, I don't want you to miss it, is that it would turn out on the path of meaning and values, religion isn't even necessary. You can do without it. Now, religion as a historical phenomena has been undergoing that kind of change for about two or more centuries. The philosopher Spinoza, in his Tractatus Logic, uh, Philosophical Politicus, I guess it is, or Religio Politicus, is the first one to really begin to suggest a way of simply dropping religion as traditionally understood and pursuing meaning on the basis of philosophical thought. And I think that's really what uh, Gould is referring to when he says he's going to offer a venerable or a holy, tradi uh, entirely traditional interpretation of the conflict between philosophy and religion. So the realm of human purposes, meanings, and values will reduce to something entirely human that has no factual basis in what the world is in which we live. It will simply be a, a dimension of our lives 
that isn't reducible to the physical and which we have to decide on our own and we're left perfectly free to do that, he suggests. We work out our own answers and we don't have to accept a set of religious dogmas uh, to do it. Uh, he tells us on page 42 that the role of true religion, see, is to bring moral contemplation rather than a set of dogmas. And he also indicates earlier that in religion, you are not free to inquire. So you can see that he is building a whole picture of religion, and on this picture, religion turns out to be simply dispensable because it doesn't deal with any factual issue at all, and therefore, on his model, it would be quite possible uh, to gain a harmony. Now, you remember that sometimes we, back in the days of the Vietnam War, we used to speak of liberating villages by burning them down. And there's something very similar that goes on here. Well, let's go more deeply into it. And uh, the first thing I need to point out is that when you speak of factual, or you hear Gould and others speaking of factual, there is a very important ambiguity involved here. And um, uh, let's just think of it like this, that uh, in one of the senses of, of, of factual, it refers to the sense-perceptible world and its theoretical presuppositions. This is basically what Gould said was the, was the magisterium of science. It's the, 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 wor the sense perceptible, please emphasize sense perceptible world and its theoretical presupposition. So that would include things like uh, particles, subparticle physics, all the way down to strings or quarks or whatever's down there. Uh, even though they're not sense perceptible, still they're, they're a part of what is required to provide a sense, uh, an explanation of the sense perceptible. And that's the way that natural fact and associated terms are used now to refer to the sense perceptible. So whatever is not sense perceptible would not be a fact. And then it's very easy to say, well, in morals, meaning, and religion, we don't deal with the sense perceptible, and therefore it's not a fact. Do you see any problem with that progression? Because there is another and very important sense of fact in which fact refers simply to whatever is the case. With no restriction to the sense perceptible. Right? It's whatever is the case. And another way of putting it is uh, anytime you have a property of something, a property that belongs to something, that's a fact. So you could say then it is a fact that 8 is divisible by 2 but it's not a sense perceptible fact. So now, the real question here is, are there any facts that are not sense perceptible? And the way Gould is dividing the territory is to say no. So anything that is not in the sense perceptible realm is going to be an area of feeling or sentiment or something of that sort, uh, but of course it will not be an area of truth, of reality. Uh, perhaps not even an area that you could theorize about. So, um, uh, I guess what I want to say at this point is simply that there's no good reason to think that all properties are sense perceptible or natural. And therefore, no good reason to think that all facts are natural. There might be non-natural facts. Now, I'm sorry that that's a little too much in the direction of hardcore philosophizing, but that everything really hangs on that. And some of you who may have worked in philosophy will know that this is a long discussion about whether or not there are non-natural facts and properties and so on, especially if you've done any work in ethics. So let's keep that in mind. I mean, there's no reason why there shouldn't be a world of non-natural properties. Now traditionally, religion has always insisted upon it. And not just the Christian religion or the Jewish religion, but for example, take the Buddhist teaching of Nirvana. Uh, that's precisely a realm of being 
where there are no natural properties or things. Uh, it still has some properties, they're very elusive, uh, but uh, they're not physical. And of course, God himself is not a physical fact. Right? Uh, it's, I often uh, distress uh, people by pointing out that God doesn't have a brain. This just really shakes them up, you know. <laughs> because how could he? But he doesn't have a brain and apparently he doesn't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always tempted at this point to say that's why everything is a no-brainer for him, but that's so terrible. I can hardly bring myself to say it. But see, religion is committed to the reality of the spiritual world. Right? And it is also committed, even with relatively tame religions, metaphysically, such as Buddhism, it's also committed to there being some form of interaction between the world which is not physical, not natural in the sense that we're using it here, and the natural world. I hope you see that the way Gould is trying to resolve the conflict between religion and science is to invite religion to give all of that up. And then there's no quarrel. Right? So now when he says science tries to document the factual character of the natural world and to develop theories that coordinate and explain these facts, see he's using fact in the sense, the first sense, of the sense perceptible world and its theoretical presuppositions. Now let me say right off, I think that is exactly the right thing to say about science. I'll read it again. Science tries to document the factual character of the natural world and to develop theories that coordinate and explain these facts. And I think that is exactly right. And I think that is exactly why religion and science has to conflict. Because religion deals with that same world and tries to explain why it exists and in some measure why things happen in it in the way they do. Now, of course, that leaves all kinds of room for natural science and encourages us to pursue inquiry and to uh, come to understand as best we can natural things in terms of natural events. And that's what the scientists should do. When you formulate a chemistry equation, you don't put in God acts here or now I pray or something of that sort. See, that, that's not what you do. You may pray. And, uh, and God may act in some way, but that's not what you're looking for when you're trying to understand uh, chemical processes. So I agree entirely with this view of science. I think it is absolutely right, uh, though I don't agree with the penumbra of philosophical views that surround it, that Gould and others put around it. And that philosophical penumbra includes most essentially the assumption that there are no facts other than natural facts, and uh, as they use the term uh, fact, uh, that statement is definitionally true. I acknowledge that. There are no facts other than uh, natural facts. If you mean by facts, natural facts, then of course that's obviously true. <laughs> but of course, if that's all you mean, then that doesn't get you what you want and need, which is a reason for believing that there are no facts other than natural facts. It just gives you the way you're choosing to use the term. Uh, and now, um, uh, once we've established that, uh, then we can go ahead and raise the question, are there any facts other than uh, non-natural facts? Well, Gould is actually rather ambiguous about what he wants to say on this point because uh, sometimes he talks as if there were no other kinds of facts and then at other points, he, is, he talks as if he were agnostic about whether or not there are those kinds of facts. And uh, in some of these passages, he, especially where he's discussing, and this lovely book in discussing stories, giving stories about historical figures and in his discussion of Darwin and T.H. Uh, Huxley's loss of their children and how it affected them, it's at that point that he 
he backs up and uses the language of agnosticism. Agnosticism is a different position. Because the agnost agnosticism would allow that there might be some conflict and just say we don't understand it. Uh, and uh, that's why I think really his position isn't uh, an agnostic position, but rather uh, a position to the effect that there are no other kinds of facts than natural facts. And that fits best with his overall uh, thesis of the book. Of course, as far as agnosticism is current, concerned, you, you would have to say that if non-natural facts had a function, then we couldn't know what they are, and in one sense, I suppose, that leaves us at the same place. Well, um, saving religion uh, in this way um, is not going to be very promising to anyone who actually believes anything in religion. Uh, those who believe nothing factual has a, a part to play in religion um, are in a position to agree with uh, Google. They can say, yes, this is the way to do it. We just concede that all the factual questions belong to science, and what we, are, what we do in religion has nothing to do with fact. On the other hand, those who believe that their religion actually makes truth claims about the world, among other things, and God's relationship to it, uh, are going to feel like they have been cheated. Um, that uh, avoiding the conflict in this way is just to simply give up the game entirely. So they're not going to feel good about that. Um, and the times when Gould talks about insight into moral truth, for example, or um, some kind of uh, knowledge, uh, he's slipping. Because what he really means to say is that the magisterium of religion has no truth in it, uh, has no reason in it, um, is simply a way of developing our feelings and managing our sentiments in such a way that we can deal with our life. Now, the view I'm taking is simply that you can, it's a good, it might be a good heuristic rule to say in science we don't look for supernatural or non-natural explanations. A heuristic rule, a rule of thumb or a procedural rule, it might be that one could reasonably propose that and, and that would be a different kind of view. Uh, that would be to limit the extent of the claims we are prepared to make but not a claim about two radically different realms of being. And it may be that uh, for some of us it would be so difficult to integrate confidence in God with scientific investigation that we would psychologically find it impossible uh, to keep the two realms separate and, and perhaps what we ought to do is simply say that um, they have no contact with, any, with, with one another. Uh, but I don't think we can rest there. I think what we have to say is there is an inherent tendency in the scientific attitude towards conflict with religion insofar as religion involves any beliefs about what is the case. Uh, since that's really the main thing I have to say to you, I'll repeat it. That there is an inherent tendency in the scientific attitude towards conflict with religion insofar as Religion involves any beliefs about what is the case. And so the solution that is proposed by Gould, and long ago it was proposed by others, and I, uh, George Santayana, longtime professor at Harvard, uh, in his book on uh, uh, reason, reason and religion, uh, calls religion a lyric cry in the business of life. A lyric cry in the business of life. So religion is a kind of poetry, and religious writings are allegorical and non-factual. They're ways of expressing ethical truths and things, truths about the meaning of life that could be much better expressed by moral understanding that we would develop independently of religion. So uh, now that view 
this solution um, is merely to invite religion to cease to exist or to transform itself into something one who believes nothing but only has certain more or less sublime and more or less permanent feelings could claim uh, to practice. Well, um, now, we need to raise the question of whether there is any likelihood that the natural world can be explained or understood in natural terms. So this, this now becomes the issue. Um, if the, the claim is that we can fully understand and explain the natural world in natural terms um, is viable, uh, then, then we must have some indication that it is possible. And I think that uh, that's where we run into trouble. I'm going to turn this on for a minute and just try to give you some uh, ideas of the areas where uh, we are most in trouble if we try to cash in the promise uh, to have an explanation of everything in scientific terms. And uh, the first thing I mention here is simply the dependent nature of the phenomenal world or the, or the world of, uh, of, uh, of nature. Everything that we find about us in nature is dependent on something else. And uh, so now um, you can look for causes uh, at great length, and there's obviously a long history here. I mean, if you're thinking in terms of 14 billion years or so of the history of the universe, that's a long run. Um, but it seems that if you have only a receding series of causes, uh, then you're faced with a difficulty. Either it has a beginning or it doesn't. If it doesn't, it's infinite. And if it's infinite, then the series could never have arrived at the point where it is because there would be an infinite series of steps to get there and those steps being infinite could never be completed. I often try to illustrate this by telling my students that I have a copy in my office, a copy of a sheet for which there's no original. There's just an infinite chain of copies. And uh, try to help them. You can also, other figures that are used are things like a chain that hangs and there's no first link, it just keeps on going up. Or a row of dominoes that is falling, knocking one another down, and it's infinite. Well, if you think about it, you realize that if it's infinite, it will never get to this one. On the other hand, if it does get to this one, it's finite, and a series which is finite in one direction is also finite in the other. And so there is some indication now that and this has been taken very seriously, especially since uh, uh, some of the scientific discoveries of recent uh, decades, uh, that there was a beginning to the physical universe. And uh, Hawking's and others have tried to elaborate this further, uh, but there's a very stubborn kind of fact here, and that is the dependent nature of the physical universe and the need for something underpinning it that is not dependent on something else. Now, that may not look exactly like God, but what it does is it opens up the universe to a range of possibilities for descriptions and introduces religious ideas as a way of treating that problem. And uh, it doesn't get you all the way to God, but it certainly makes a big difference in uh, this issue of scientific explanation. Can you explain everything in terms of natural causes and the laws there. Well, actually not. Uh, you have a problem here not only with initial conditions, but also with things like why do we have the laws of, uh, of nature that we have. Leibniz long ago pointed out that the laws of mechanics do not explain the laws of mechanics. Now, of course, you can go back to some level. Uh, some laws do explain other laws. But uh, the natural tendency of that, quest is to, of that quest is to arrive, if possible, at a law which is not explained by a further law. And so it may be that we can explain some of the forces of nature in terms of others, but eventually we come to one 
and that one is one which is not explained in terms of something else. That's if you've got if you've got a unified theory, then you'd have to stand before it in mute amazement at best, uh, because that would be the end of the explanation, and you, there would be no explanation within nature of why those laws hold. Well, that's pretty complicated, and you'll probably want to discuss it in the in the discussion. So let me just move on quickly to the others. Awareness or consciousness and the awareness of awareness or consciousness of consciousness. Um, this is basically the problem of the nature of the mind. And of course here at Stanford and uh, at all of our universities there's a lot of work on this and uh, so a lot of room for discussion but let me just make the comment that when you consider the nature of the mind closely and the properties that the mind has, properties of thoughts, feelings, choices, if you allow for that, many people don't, um, but choice, character formation, uh, you can elevate it up a level or two and talk about logical relations uh, which occur between thoughts. Uh, those are areas where we don't have the beginnings of an explanation in terms of natural science. Now, usually in a group like this, I, you, a lot of people get very nervous about that, and they want to talk about all the things we know about the brain. And I'm glad to say we know a lot about the brain and, probably, and need to know a lot more about it. But if it weren't for the fact that we are conscious of our own mental states and able thereby to correlate them with what happens in the brain, we would never know there was such a thing as consciousness. If all you had to look at was the brain, no matter at what level you looked at it or what level of analysis, you would never know there was such a thing as, uh, as, uh, as the thought of, uh, of uh, George W. or whatever you like to think about. <laughs> Lemon pie. Um, right? I mean, you would never know there was such a thing. You'd never look at this, at this chemical process going, oh, that's a, that's, a pers that's a thought of Yankee Doodle Dandy. See, you'd never know that. And uh, so... Now, this gets, uh, again, in pretty deep metaphysical water, but uh, let me just cut through it all just to say that here we have something that we haven't the beginnings of an explanation from within the natural sciences. Doesn't mean we don't know anything about it. You see, if you're locked into the natural sciences, the only body of knowledge, and what corresponds to it as the only reality, then you can't have any knowledge of the mind. Of course, we do have knowledge of the mind. We couldn't, we couldn't have got here today if we hadn't, right? I mean, that's... Well, you didn't come here by the laws of nature. You came here by thoughts and intentions and choices and things of that sort. That's what brought you here. And you know what they are, and so you have knowledge. The third, great events and people in history. And Now, remember my point is this, that we don't have the beginnings of an explanation or understanding of these in terms of the natural sciences. And, of course, uh, great people... I mentioned Jesus Christ himself because of all the figures in history, he is the greatest enigma. Understanding how Napoleon accomplished what he did is nothing to trying to understand how Jesus Christ accomplished what he did. See, this, uh, this is a standing invitation for people who wish to know about reality to investigate that. Right? And it's very hard to imagine that we would really want to know about it if we weren't willing to look at that. Fourth, the power of beauty. I, I like to think of beauty as uh, sense manifest goodness. Um, that's the, when, you, when you see a flower or something beautiful, you experience joy and you want to give thanks. And uh, G.K. Chesterton has this phrase where he says the most embarrassing moment for the atheist is when he wants to give thanks and there's no one to give thanks to. <laughs> and... Uh, See, that beauty does that. Beauty makes you thankful. You experience something beautiful, and your heart expands, and you, you say, this is sense manifest goodness. Well, all these points are highly contestable philosophical, philosophically, but let me just go on and finish up. The experience of co-working with God. Um, co-working with God means you're doing something, and... What comes out of it is something you could not possibly have accomplished. And uh, in the tradition of Christianity from the beginning up to the present day, this is a constant reality that is presented. And 
It is, as I said last night, an experiential reality. It is something that you're invited to find out by venturing on. You venture on it. That's called faith. You trust, and you act, and you move into it, and then you come to know the reality of it. And uh, here we could talk about many kinds of experience of prayer and other kinds of things, worship and so on, or of uh, setting out to accomplish something that is humanly impossible, and lo and behold, it is accomplished. And of course, there are always the details to work through, the questions of whether or not it's actually happening, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with uh, and it's all right for the religious person to exercise the free spirit of inquiry. This is one of the things that, that Gould obviously had picked up from misdescriptions uh, of the religious attitude, because part of what he is, goes over in the early chapters of his book is doubting Thomas, and how do doubting Thomas was supposedly uh, mistaking the magisterium in which he was operating in when he said, Unless I put my hand in his side and in, in the prints in his hand, I will not believe. And, and Gould rather scolds Brother Thomas about that and suggests that he was confused as to which magisterium he was in. He was actually trying to operate in the magisterium of science when it, he was in the magisterium of religion. You see, religion is not opposed to free inquiry. Not at all. Ask any question. We don't have anything to hide. If we do... Uh, then perhaps we haven't understood uh, what our religion is about. Now, I have to admit that religion as an authoritative cultural form does try to shut down free inquiry. But, you know, it's, it, it, when we're thinking about religions worldwide, we must remember not to assign the results of raw humanity to religion as such. And what happens is religion gets taken over by the human side, and because it is such an incredibly powerful force, it is, uh, it is dragooned into serving uh, sometimes very awful ends. Well, uh, now, the things I'm talking about here are not new, uh, and they're not settled, and I'm not trying to suggest that they are. Uh, but, for example, throughout the last uh, three centuries, there have been repeated attempts to bring this out, uh, now the names are often not known, but for example, there was a very famous mathematician and philosopher named Dubois Raymond uh, back in the uh, 1870s who uh, published a series of very helpful papers on the limitations of what we could ever hope to understand merely by operating within that, uh, within that magisterium, as Google calls it, of natural facts and theories designed to rationalize them. David Hume uh, makes a wonderful uh, statement that uh, about uh, how we should be careful in trying to give ultimate explanations of things. And uh, the way it reads is something like this, that no philosopher who is modest and rational, here it is, uh, no philosopher who is rational and modest has ever pretended to assign the ultimate causes of any natural operation or show distinctly the action of that power which produces any single effect in the universe. See, no philosopher who is rational and modest, well, you don't meet a lot of those on the road. <laughs> um, and and it's, a, it's a real spiritual attainment, no doubt, to, to arrive there. But it is a deep and important truth. Science is not in the business of ultimate explanations. That's not what it does. It works on specific things, it advances theories, it refines them as far as possible, but it never makes a claim about everything. And for example, the basic claim that only natural facts exist, you will never find in a science book. You'll never find it in a science book. Uh, I've uh, often challenged people to find one accredited, peer-reviewed textbook in any science that offers an ontological conclusion. You won't find it. And that's the good sense of the scientists who do the peer reviewing and, uh, and uh, determine what gets used and what doesn't in scientific teaching. 
There's no reason why it should make such a claim. So, for example, when you read an equation like E equals mc squared, you have to understand the universe of discourse in which that operates. That's not a statement about all energy. That's a statement about all matter. It doesn't say that all energy is related to matter. It says that all matter is related to energy in a certain way. And see, that meets our needs as human beings because we have the matter and we need the energy. If it's no more than we need to build a fire in the stove to keep ourselves warm. Science simply does not make these total claims. And the, uh, there's a great difference between religious teaching and scientific teaching because religion precisely does try to make all-inclusive claims. It does not make them fundamentally at the level of theory, but it tells stories. And stories are designed to give completeness. Isn't that true of every story you ever heard? It begins with once upon a time long ago and far away, right? And then at the other end it says, and they lived happily ever afterwards, right? You see, you have a beginning, an end, and a middle. And really, in science, you never have that. And the attempts of many well-known people, such as Gould, or Dawkins, or Hawking, or others, to try to give total theories, uh, always winds up with uh, f mathematical fictions, uh, pleasing images of one sort or another, uh, but something short of what they're intending. So now, uh, let's just say one more thing here, because um, what we have coming down the road now in our culture is uh, spirituality. And uh, spirituality is going to get us all. And the reason for this is because we have such desperate needs for spirituality. But it's going to be a spirituality that has no restrictions in terms of truth and reason. And it's going to be a spirituality that says all spiritualities are equal because they do not deal in the realm of fact. And um, there's so many things here. I think you probably uh, read these things in the papers. But uh, issues, just precisely what Gould is talking about, issues of purpose and meaning, of values, uh, of self-worth, that's a primary spiritual issue now. All of these are spiritual values. We have people getting excited about this now in the academy. You may have read or read of the uh, statement that came out in the New York Times a few days ago from David Scott, uh, who uh, has uh, stated, and he had been a high-level administrator at the University of Massachusetts, I believe it was, and uh, he's, he's stating that uh, we have ghettoized religion in the academy and that we need to bring it back. Uh, we, we have to have a spiritual dimension to the campus. And you know, I believe that's right. But which one is it going to be? You see, what I want you to realize as I close here today is simply that the recommendation that Gould is making is, among other things, designed to allow us to say that in the realm of spirituality, anything goes. That spirituality is good because it meets a deep human need. And there's no question to be asked about spirituality of what. And the reason that he can do that and the reason you will increasingly see this on campus is precisely because the area of religion, of morals, of spirituality, of meaning and purpose has been cut loose from reality, and is left to run on its own. And that is going to undermine the rationality of the rest of the campus. Because eventually, you see, the university enterprise is a moral enterprise. And it has to be able to answer the question of what is the moral basis of science itself and the academic and intellectual life. And if that is not a domain of fact, then it's going to be merely the domain of feeling, and it will invariably come under the sway of political forces. So with that, let me stop and see if you have any questions or comments. Yes.
design movement. So the prominent figures there being Dembski, Bailey, yeah. Johnson. How right. well do they address your topic here today? Uh, in terms of the inherent logic, uh, the, the question is there's, a, there's something called the intelligent design movement now that's very active and uh, has increasingly gotten attention. And uh, now uh, I think it's MIT recently just published a big book pulling a lot of this stuff together for and against and actually has in it a paper by Gould in which he presents the seeds of the theory I've been discussing today. I think for a person who wishes to approach this as a rational matter, it has a lot to say. But for the person who has already decided that it is not a rational matter, it has nothing to say. And so from the viewpoint, if you wish, of pure logic, it has something to say. From the viewpoint of rhetoric or being able to convince, it will do nothing. And the, and the way it will go is simply, if you have bought the idea that anything be, can be produced by a long enough time, of variation, then you will buy uh, non-intelligent design. Uh, the, the Blind Watchmaker, the book by Dawkins, is a beautiful illustration of this. I see no matter how much you refine the design that is there, and uh, there are a lot of people that are doing this, and they have a lot to say. It's fascinating to say it. Hugh Ross's uh, operation just put out a paper talking about how Jupiter uh, how it, or Saturn I had drifted into its orbit, and, and if it had not, there wouldn't have been any possibility of life. That's very striking, and I'm sure it's right. But you see, a person who has already bought the thesis that talk of a designer is merely meaningless stuff will not be moved by it. So what we, the, where we have to fight the battle is a little lower down on the pole, and it's precisely with this issue of whether or not there can be or are facts that are not sense-perceptible, natural facts. That's where we have to fight the battle. And uh, if, you, if you can gain that, then there's, there's really not a problem with the designer, I think. It's, it becomes quite reasonable to expect to believe that if you have not already bought the agnostic or meaningless thesis that Gould is actually pushing. Got a, got a follow-up follow -up question. Uh, let's see, we need the microphone on, on here to get it on, on tape as right. well. Regarding his, his question, um, Darwinian theory, or Darwin's theory, can account for the survival of the fittest, Right. but critics uh, often said it never accounted for the arrival of the fittest. Oh, no, it's true. And that, um, yes, very in good. essence, Darwinists call upon random chance more or less as a god of the gaps. One might say they've discovered Einstein's mm -hmm. dice and we're, we're dealing with right. a god of craps. Yes, well, I so mean, there's what, so what many value, things. What value does, does that have scientifically if it has no... Uh, so many points here to make. One is chance never explains anything. Chance isn't something, right? Chance is a way of our talking about things we don't understand. Like, so for example, games of chance. You go play roulette. I hope you don't, but maybe you do. <laughs> Go play roulette. It isn't a game of chance. Where that marble turns up is rigorously determined by the laws of physics. There's no chance there at all. We don't know where it's going to turn up, so we call it a game of chance and waste our money on it. Uh, but uh, there's, chance doesn't explain anything. Here's another thing to understand. By the mere logic of the case, evolution cannot explain creation, which is your point, I think. Arrival, right? And here's why. See, if you know what evolution is, you know that it presupposes organisms or something, entities, with a method of propagation in an environment which will select from that uh, progeny of whatever kind. Uh, now, it's, uh, people are trying to extend it to clays, clays that propagate themselves and so on. But leave that aside. Evolution always requires an environment. It can't work without that. Therefore, it cannot account for creation. That is, the origination or arrival of things. It simply can't do it. Now, Darwin never tried to get it to do that. Darwin was concerned with a very specific issue, and when he speaks of, many people don't know that the origin of the species is not a discussion of where did species come from. It's a discussion of where the present species came from or perhaps a few of the past ones. But it isn't a discussion of where do species come from. Right? He never discusses that question. 
he presupposes the existence of species and then says, now where did the present one come from? How they get from there to here, right? But that's perfectly decent. But see, what happens is there is a need, a hunger, to reach out and explain everything. We need that as human beings. We need, it, things have to make sense. And if you have set aside a God who is capable of self-existence and producing a world, then you're going to talk about, as I often hear, I hear people talking about, well, you know, the universe just evolved out of nothing. Nothing evolves out of nothing. Right? You, you have to have something before evolution can happen. And that is why biological evolution, by the way, is really irrelevant to the argument from design. If, if life had never originated and everything was in place, you'd still have order to explain. And uh, so it's unfortunate that the argument got associated by Paley and others with things like eyes and so on, uh, because it would apply even if all there were were atoms and galaxies and so on. Okay. I did have a question, actually. I was just making a comment about, about that. Okay. May I have to ask a question? It's related to Gould. Um, regarding the, the origin of virtually all the major animal body plants in the Cambrian explosion, Gould has stated that uh, the Burgess Shale yeah. teaches us that for the history of basic anatomical designs, almost everything happened in the geological moment just before, and almost nothing in the more than 500 million years since. Mm -hmm. And in this context, you stated, to know the reasons for infrequent change, one must, ordin one must understand the ordinary rules of stability. He said, stasis is data. Mm -hmm. Well, if the goal of science is to explain things naturalistically without recourse to God, it could explain stasis, it could explain stability, it could explain why things do not gradually change from one form to another. Uh, on the basis of purely natural processes. Could you make a comment that about a theory of conservation or a theory of macrostasis, and could that be within the realm of legitimate natural science? An anti but It can theory. be if it can be subsumed under higher laws. See, that's what we, we all start way back from uh, little regularities, and we want to know why that, and we find a higher law and a more inclusive law, and we look for more and more inclusive laws. So if stasis can be subsumed under some higher law, then right, we could do that. But uniformitarianism, you know, never was able to establish itself as, an, as a kind of an ultimate law. It was simply an assumption that we used to try to understand the process from there to here uh, as best we could. And so now the discovery of these cataclysmic changes raises a problem with what is happening. And People, I'm sure there's somebody who will come up with something. Like you know. natural selection that might eliminate useless incipient stages or something like, like that? Yes, could. Could do it. Okay. Of course, you see, natural selection was always opposed to artificial selection, but that was intelligent design. Farmers who grew plants and animals and selected for which genes would get passed on. Right? So it's just a question of trying to figure out what the mechanism of selection is. And then wrinkles like, why would it advance so rapidly at one point and not another? And, uh, you know, I, I would certainly look for a natural explanation of that if I were me. But on the other hand, I wouldn't be caught in a position of saying, it is absolutely impossible that God intervened at this point to cause things to happen. See, that, that can be, as C.S. Uh, Lewis says in his essay on Hume and Miracles, simply, well, look, you know, what happens with miracles is just a matter of a higher process taking over. And, and this happens at low-level events. You say iron can't float, and then you find if you shape it just right, it can float. Okay? Well, that's not a miracle. That's a higher law. And what Lewis tries to do is, is present intervention, if you wish, on that same model. And uh, that is an open possibility unless you have made an all-inclusive statement that there just isn't anything else to do that. And then you, if you make that, then you have to say where you got that. Over here, I believe, and then... Yes. Does Gould attempt to resolve the dilemma that he creates with his dichotomy between the knowable and the unknowable? Francis Schaeffer, I think, used to argue that 
those who postulate that type of a universe can't ultimately live in it because ultimately no. they're, they're called to make moral decisions and more, make moral statements. No, uh, that's right. Uh, Gould doesn't uh, try to resolve it. Uh, he glories in the asceticism of it, in that he was raised in a certain religious tradition, though, of course, it's been set aside, that he really does respect and love music and other wonderful things, and including that is the mystery of, of choice and all those kinds of things. That's not a resolution. Schaefer's point still stands. You see, Schaefer's point was precisely that if you made this dichotomy, you abandoned rationality. That was Schaeffer's point, if you remember, and he has a whole story about what happened in modern thought and how that worked. And if you look at it, you, you, you're bound to say something like that did happen. Now, Gould is, in the, Gould is in the position of more or less just saying, yeah, that's the way things are. And uh, each individual, I, I didn't go very deeply into his quotations, but what he says, every individual has to decide for themselves what is right and wrong to do. Well, of course, that's right where we are today. Okay. This gentleman here. How do you define fact so that it includes non-natural facts? Yes, good. Thank you for asking. Because and by what criteria yeah. do you distinguish non-natural mm -hmm. from non-natural Well, I don't like the natural, non-natural distinction. I, I've, I've written a lot on that. And, uh, and by the way, if, if you're interested in the stuff I say about a lot of philosophical things, I, I have a web page which my daughter maintains, and it has more on there than you'll ever want to see. <laughs> uh, it's just dwillard.org, and, uh, and, and there's a paper on there called Knowledge and Naturalism, in which I try to talk about the difficulty, and, it, and frankly, it's, it's impossible to pin down naturalism. I have used here just the distinction between what is sense perceptible and what is not, and I've included what may be theoretically required to explain that, because, of course, most of what we now pack into matter isn't sense perceptible at all. Um, very little, little to nothing of it is now. Certainly, once you get down subparticle physics, none of it is. So uh, now here's. Uh, see, I think this is the most important point that I have to say to you. What is a fact? A fact is simply a matter of a property belonging to something. Now, what is a property? Well, it's a respect in which things may differ or resemble. Now, I've stated that in a way where it doesn't beg any question. It doesn't close up. It might be that naturalism were true. Perhaps all of the properties are natural properties, and by that I would just mean sense perceptible or something presupposed in that. Uh, so a fact is a matter of a property belonging to something, and that lays the foundation for truth. A, a belief is true if what it is about is as that belief holds it to be. If I believe there's gas in my tank, then it's true if there's gas in my tank. If I believe there are atoms, it's true if there are atoms. If I believe that God created the world, it's true if God created the world. Right. So you, one of the keys in philosophy is do your general ontology in a way that doesn't beg any important questions. Right. That's, and it's really important. And it's very hard to do. Right. And, and, uh, and as far as my areas of teaching is concerned, I teach more in ontology or metaphysics than any other area because I think that's crucial. And this is your question falls in that area. So I would just say that uh, a fact is a matter of a property belonging to something or a relation belonging to something. And then what's the difference between natural and non-natural? Well, insofar as I would make one, I would say use sense perception as a criterion. So for example, I know that I'm seeing you now. Now, my seeing of you now exists, but it's not sense perceptible. You're sense perceptible, but not my seeing of you. Okay? My seeing you is a property of my mind. Right? It goes into that. The direction on you is a property of the seeing. I see you clearly. That's a property of the seeing. I see you fuzzily. <laughs> right? That's a property of the seeing. Now, to all of these things, there are no doubt some correlations in my brain. But they're not the same. And one of the interesting things that has emerged in recent years in research is it appears that our experiences do a great deal to shape our brain. And not just the other way around. 
So there's an interaction there. So that's the way I would go at it. And then, of course, in the area of morality, meaning, beauty, these other things I put up here, you're free to explore that. That doesn't commit you to their existence. It might turn out that everything that exists is physical. And that, but that, you see, you don't want to settle that issue by the way you define your terms at the outset. And I think that is what happens normally with people like Google. They settle the issue by defining fact in terms of the natural. Yes, sir, way in the back. Thank you. Yes, this might give me a chance to shade into something from last night, but if it's out of bounds, we can save it. And that is, you mentioned last night um, how engagement with objectivity, if I'm representing it correctly, is the right. way to freedom. Right. And I think maybe there's a, an actual brain corollary here from what you just said, but could you just develop that point a little bit from last night? Especially if you can find a way to link it with today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do think that uh, the mind itself is capable of grasping stuff that isn't a part of it. And that its, its capacity to do that is foundational for the growth of the self and the will. Because the self and the will only grow by incorporating others. Right? That's fundamental to community. And it's fundamental to all the moral principles that traditionally have guided community from families on up. So I'm not sure how, uh, how much that develops the point, but it's, it's very important to understand that the will is not a physical reality. And again, how do you know? Well, the properties are not physical. And that that will has to reach out to a world which includes not just physical reality, but non-physical realities. See, when I, when I see you, I see a person. Right? And if I wanted to get to know you, the worst thing I could do is open you up and examine your insides. Right? <laughs> yeah, I approach you a person, I say, how you doing? Good. What's your name? Jenna. Jenna? Yes. I'm pleased to meet you. Yes. Now see, that's the way you get to know a person, isn't it? <laughs> You reach out in that way, and then, and then your, your will, and in this case, the, another will over here, which is not just my imagination, that's real. And uh, there's a wonderful Jewish writer named Levinas, who has so much to say about this currently that I would encourage you to have a look at his, his writings, his book called Totality and Infinity, which is a wonderful exploration precisely of this capacity to reach out to an objective world and how an objective world calls to us and as persons is already within us in the form of other persons that have been a part of our upbringing. But now again, let me just say, you see, all of this is a matter of properties and properties belonging to things and so on, and that's what I think we have to be most careful about in addressing someone like Gould. Because what Gould is really saying is, you have the area of facts and reality, and then you have this other area, and we're going to reconcile religion and science by letting religion have nothing. So, thank you, Mr. Gould. I'll decline that offer. <laughs> right? And I say, let's be serious about this and explore the question as to what reality there is to religion, morality, and meaningfulness, values, purpose, and all of that, without just saying it's more fluff that has no place in reality gentleman here? Yes. Have you made any comment on the uh, spiritual implications of the erasure of history? Uh, I said just about three words about that last night when I, when I commented that the individual will taken in the Nietzschean sense abandons community. And history is always communal and community is always historical. See, when you find an absence of community, you will find a broken history. And that is what happens over and over, especially in a world where there's a lot of change. We are essentially time-bound creatures that carry a past within us. And if we disown that past, we impoverish ourselves. And that is perhaps one way of formulating Alistair McIntyre's critique of modern uh, ethical thought is how it has disowned, through Nietzschean influences, uh, how it has disowned its past. See, that's, that's inherent in modernism. Modernism is a word that derives from mode or style or now. And nowism is a good translation of modernism. And nowism 
breaks the historical connection and dissolves the community and leaves the individual floundering within themselves. Paula. Yes. I specifically came here today because I was told you hadn't made enough of a monster of Nietzsche. <laughs> I think Nietzsche should be treated kindly. Uh, Nietzsche is a pathetic figure uh, raised in a, in a very devout Christian home. Uh, by the time he was four, he, could, he read the Bible with such pathos that his family wept. And that his family wept by the time he was four years old, four years old. And he grew up in that atmosphere and fundamentally went into the institutions surrounding him, including the university, and found so much disappoint, disappointment in the quality of life that was there that he soured and devoted the rest of his life to tearing down and really had nothing to build up. And he threw slogans out like Ubermensch and so on. I didn't say anything about that last night because I think, really think it's not, it's not going to help us very much. I mean, we have to understand that here is a man who was captured by the thought and the culture of his time, turned in on it, and really did not originate much on his own. He was more a symbol than he was an originator. Almost everything he has to say is barred from someone else. And so, I don't think he was a monster. I think he was a very sad human being. This gentleman here. Yeah. How do you talk to people? How do you respond to people who actually want to leave nothing to science? Or who want religion? Well, that's, see, that's what Gould is afraid of. Right? He, and, and he's justified in that. Because currently, in many parts of our academic and uh, larger culture, there are serious attacks on science. And it isn't just from uh, right-wing uh, conservatives or evangelical Christians. Uh, Postmodernism is a term that, for, in the minds of many people, stands for the rejection of science. And the operant terms here are Auschwitz and Hiroshima. You say, oh, you want to see what science, or the other terms like rainforest and uh, so on. And so there's, there is a very serious issue here. And I'm on, I am on Google's side as far as that goes. Because as I said at the outset, I think the primary work of God in human history is science. And uh, so this is a very serious and important matter. But uh, unfortunately, Google doesn't seem to know where his friends are on that. On that. And it's in particular, the idea that, uh, that science is based on uh, an order in creation by a rational God. See, it's, he's, he's, right now he's too worried about people who are questioning evolution and particularly the intelligent design people. And so he's out here trying to box with them. And he, I don't think he really knows where the enemy is. Gentlemen. Yeah, I had a question just in terms of uh, trying to understand. Your, the title and the thesis sort of sound like there's a necessary conflict between religion and yes. science. But as I'm listening to you, it sounds like there could be a right relationship. Between there could two. be, um, but it's not likely. But, okay, in, in that right relationship, is there still a necessary conflict? I guess I'm asking, is there something in which there always would have to butt heads? That in, you know? There wouldn't be a conflict if scientists were capable of pressing their legitimate drive to explain natural events in natural terms if they could restrict themselves to saying, we do not explain totalities. See, but that would require humility, <laughs> right? And both religion and science has a problem with humility. So I think uh, what we want to say here, Jonathan, is it isn't a logically necessary conflict. But psychologically, I would have to say it is inevitable, given that human beings are like they are. This lady right here. Well, the alternative would be to give an explanation of God or whatever it is you treat as... See, every religion involves two things. It involves an other realm of some sort. And that means out of the physical. Every, and I'm just making that as a historical claim. And you can check it out, whether it's Confucianism or whatever, Shinto. Or, it involves that. And then it involves the claim that we can interact with that realm and that it will make a difference in our lives here. Right. 
So now the alternative would be to give an explication of the other realm, which was not in non-physical terms. You'd have to be able to give an explication of the other realm in terms of the physical world. And uh, that's what I'm saying is uh, it, to, to take that route is just to abandon religion. Now you have a, still a lot of latitude as to what you say about that other world. Right? And, and as to how you say it relates to this one. See, one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, Gould more or less idolizes in his book is uh, the uh, standard treatment of deism. And uh, many people that in, in the period he likes to refer to, uh, many people were Christians and deists. And their thesis was, well, there is a God, he just has nothing to do with the natural world. And he tells the little story that's so often told about how a piece of uh, mechanism that uh, requires constant tending is not as good as one which can run without its maker, as if that were the only consideration. You know, but he, see, he's trying to tell a different story here, one that's more friendly to his view, where God exists, but as far as what's going on now, it makes no difference, because God never intervenes. So then that would raise questions like, what do you make of prayer? What do you make of spiritual exercises such as meditation and so on? Does that contact another realm? Does that other realm then have an effect on you? Or is it just a mood adjustment, which you might do at the cocktail hour or something of that sort? So that's, that's the real question as to what would the alternative be? How would you describe this other realm if you had to do it in physical terms? Yes? Well, I mean, it's an open question. Anytime there's a gap, is it God or is it something else? See, I mean, you, you say, well, this, we thought that when lightning struck, God did it. And then we found out he didn't. And so when something else happened, disease hit, we thought God did it. And then we found out he didn't. Well, it's kind of like the, the boy that cried wolf in reverse. Finally, the wolf came. Okay. So, I mean, you still, you still have to answer the question, in a given case, is that God? Right? And this would require some research and thought on your part. See, that would be different from a dogmatic attitude. It can't be God, because all there is is the physical world. And that's what many people have. Their view of God is actually that there's this great big universe, and there's God, this little thing, trying to do something about it. Right? <laughs> And, uh, of course, uh, another view is that the physical universe is a little thing in a great big God. So that's the way you go. This gentleman back here has been wanting to say something. Uh, my name is Johannes Rusko. I was born and raised not far away from uh, where Friedrich Nietzsche was uh, born. And uh, I went to school during the Nazi area when Hitler uh, glorified Friedrich Nietzsche. Of course, we know that Friedrich Nietzsche taught that God is dead and Christianity is the greatest uh, catastrophe for humankind and the soul is an invention. Uh, but the worst part of Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy was his, where his ideas about the Übermensch, the superhuman being, and the superhuman being became a philosophical foundation for Adolf Hitler to uh, to differentiate between the subhuman being mm -hmm. where the Jews, my mm -hmm. Jewish friend who lived on the same street and landed in Auschwitz, but I was a superhuman being because I had blonde hairs and blue eyes. I, in my opinion, sir, you have dealt with, uh, with uh, British Nietzsche too gently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, you, your experience gives you a right to say that. He laid the foundation out of it. He laid the philosophical foundation for Adolf Hitler, uh, for Adolf Hitler to send uh, six million Jews into the gas chambers to Auschwitz because they were considered inferior and inferior race. And are we not today in a similar situation where we discuss the value of human life? Which pathos is valuable and deserves life? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I would submit to you as a historical claim 
which would be very difficult to substantiate, that not one less Jew would have died had Nietzsche never existed. That Hitler used him as a rationalization, that he was going to do what he was going to do. And uh, I, now, if I wanted to criticize Nietzsche, I would criticize him for not saying things that would have prevented Hitler from doing that. As it was, I think he was duped by his own philosophical sources into being something that would actually foster a cultural atmosphere. Uh, but that was because he lay aside Christianity. And you want to remember also that, uh, that Hitler was a relentless foe of Christianity. He was an antichrist. And uh, so uh, I'm very sensitive and grateful to you for saying what you have because you have a place to speak from that perhaps no one else in the room does. Uh, but uh, Nietzsche never thought he was the Ubermensch. He didn't think they're anywhere on the horizon. He was the in-between man, as he says. Um, but he was responsible for giving some Nietzsche has done more harm to young people on university campuses in America than he did to anyone else. But still, thank you for your comment. I very much appreciate it. And I think it's now time. I have time for one oh, okay, good. Right here. Yeah, well, I'll point it out right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, uh, you can see it right in Google's book, for example, but let, just go back to the topic of prayer. Many people experience the conflict deeply in their prayer life because they have been taught in a society, in a system of knowledge which says everything is causal. And there is nothing that affects things other than the causation in the natural course of events. That makes it very difficult to impossible to actually pray. Because if you're going to pray, now Frank Laubach, whom I mentioned last night, had another book called Prayer, the Mightiest Force on Earth. And what he meant by that was that prayer touches the force that controls all forces. Right? And sometimes you might like to read the Bible just to see places where you think nuclear power may have shown up. I won't tell you that you, you have a look. And uh, so, you see, it's, that's one of the places where we come into sharp conflict. Uh, other issues like the resurrection of Christ, uh, the inspiration of the scriptures. Uh, take the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Just run through it. See, now, if that, the idea that this cannot be taken as a statement of fact because we know that science does not permit it is extremely common. See, I, I had a, one of my colleagues at USC in the religion department was talking with a young man. The young man said to him, well, you know, uh, I believe in the resurrection of Christ. And the man said, well, but that's contrary to the laws of physics. That's the conflict. Now, I, you know, I don't know which law of physics it's contrary to. And if you take a larger view, uh, you might say that's like saying it's contrary to the laws of physics to float in water, for iron, for iron to float in water. No, it isn't contrary to the laws of physics. It depends on how they're applied. If you hollow the iron out enough, it'll float. Okay. So it's, it's a question of what laws come into play. But see, many people have this idea, no, this couldn't have happened because it's contrary to the laws of physics. And certainly if it did happen, you can't explain it within the laws of physics as we know them. But then if E equals mc squared perhaps says something more than, uh, than just a comment about the energy that is available in matter, then there are all sorts of possibilities that open up. 
There you have to stay out of the God of the gaps thing. Again, if you're a scientist, you don't look for a miracle in the process. You look for the natural process. But that's where the humility comes in, you see. And we have to be prepared to not go for total explanations. And religion has that same problem. You know, the bishop that said to Galileo, I don't need to look through your, through your telescope. I already know that there are no moons around Jupiter. See, that's arrogance in the other direction. So we have to stay out of that. Um, one more? Yeah, one more. Yeah, one more. <laughs> okay. We're going to give you the last word. Actually, it's a, it's a follow-up of sorts, and it relates to the last question. Uh, if, if, the, if there's conflict uh, between religion and science over the resurrection, I certainly feel that myself. Mm -hmm. Yes. So higher right. Exactly right. Factual. Sure. And, and, and when you look at a lot of beliefs which are, uh, which are promoted mm -hmm. as, uh, as higher law or supernatural, uh, for example, the existence of witches mm -hmm. and the burning of witches, mm -hmm. uh, you, you need to have some sort of criteria yes. by which you can say or with some. Right. Well, the lower law will say it can't happen within the range of considerations that that law covers. If there is, isn't something more than just the natural processes of decomposition going on, uh, there isn't going to be any resurrection. Well, I didn't really want to take away from the question of the criteria. How, how, how do you... Yeah, okay, well, go back to your witches. I and mean, I hear just logical consistency in interpretation of Scripture. For example, look at the scripture that says witches should be burned. Consider everything else it says. Disobedient children should be stoned. All kinds of other things. Now, if you believe that, then you would do all of these things. So if you don't believe it, that means you're being selective and probably you're being driven, as these people certainly were, by irrational fears and tendencies. And they gave in to them. So, I mean, there's no... There's no uh, substitute for just careful thinking about things. And in most cases, then criteria will emerge. Uh, mob psychology is notorious for overwhelming rationality. And those are things we need to respect. We, need, we should know that. Uh, because we've seen a lot of it in, in the scriptures that we cite as uh, somehow um, normative for how we think and feel. I think actually just a good reading of the scriptures would have saved us from most of the things that are now rightly embarrassing in the, in the past of Christian culture. There's a, I don't think there is a simple answer. Uh, generally speaking, criteria emerge from working the data. They emerge from the subject matter. Method must conform to the subject matter. And in this case, uh, you have to inquire into the meanings of words, uh, how things may be taken, logical relations, and also into what else, what else may be moving people who are caught up in it. Same thing would be true in the evolution debate today. See, we have to be careful, watch our thinking, respect the laws of logic, respect truth, not be stampeded into things, and unfortunately Christians are not notorious for that. You know? that but see, that's again, that's where, that's where humanity takes over. Uh, one of Nietzsche's phrases, you know, menschliche, also menschliche, human, all to human. Uh, and that's where most of our problems come from. Well, thank you. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at www.veritas.org.